Jeff Danziger has been lampooning, as you can see all around you, quite brilliantly, more American presidents than anyone else I know. He is the most jocular curmudgeon you will ever meet, as you will discover, and the most woke as well. One of the founding members of Cartooning for Peace, which is an international organization of cartoonists based in Paris that he is one of the founding members of, and it's an extraordinary group. He is among the most extraordinary, but he has the supreme value of having Bernard Goldberg, a former CBS News colleague of mine who has gone determinately over to the dark side, number him as one of the hundred people who are screwing up America the most. <laughs> so, 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 right, a round of applause, yes, indeed. So now, to tell us just how he won such an honor and a lot of other things, Jeff Danziger. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to have been asked to uh, speak here, and I want to thank you all for coming. I uh, haven't been in the presence of this many journalists, and I want to say up front that the myth that cartoonists, political cartoonists, don't work very hard is, uh, is wrong. We work very hard, and during the Trump administration, of course, we work even harder. We work every day. Every day there's one of these, oh my God, oh my God moments that comes along. And Monday I thought I would take a day off because it was President's Day and I couldn't figure out what they would do for the oh my God moment of the day. So I got up late and I uh, went down to the kitchen and got myself a cup of coffee and then I turned on the uh, computer to the Washington Post news channel. And oh my God. <laughs> Stephen Miller had gotten married. <laughs> but uh, we try to make the cartoons funny if we can. And uh, it's a combination of, of uh, artwork and caricature and watching the news and uh, uh, metaphors from uh, literature and movies and everything else, but actually the thing that's hardest to come up with is uh, make sure that the timing is exactly right. And if you can get the joke right on the news, right where it's supposed to be. I was reminded during the New Hampshire primary, so we had a, uh, a governor up in Vermont, Howard Dean, and Howard decided that he wanted to run for president, so he got into the, Nash the New Hampshire primary, and he, he didn't do too badly. And after the primary, he made a speech. And at the end of his speech, for some reason, he gave this scream, blood-curdling scream. And it, uh, we all had a good time with that and made cartoons and funny remarks about it. And then about a month later, the uh, monk painting, the scream, was stolen from the uh, Oslo Museum. So we were able, I was able to make a cartoon saying that maybe until they got the painting back, we could loan them Howard. There's no school of uh, political cartooning, so we sort of learn from each other and from history gone back. I was thinking about Honoré Daumier, who did uh, cartoons about the French judges and, and the lawyers. These were very, they were brutal cartoons showing these people for what they were. And I thought, well, we should start doing something uh, close to that about the judges that the Trump and uh, McConnell forces have, have put in put in place, uh, who are fairly young people and are going to be there for quite a long time. Uh, the best artist ever is a German cartoonist named Heinrich Klee, K-L-E-Y. And if you haven't ever seen his work, uh, you should try to look it up. There are books that are printed by uh, Dover Press, and he's just marvelous. And the thing that he sort of taught us, besides being an expert in human anatomy is that you had to learn animal anatomy. And Clay did these drawings of using crocodiles and alligators and elephants and uh, monkeys and horses and probably most amazing 
tigers as a, as a character representing something in politics. And I always thought that Thomas Nast, who is the uh, granddaddy of all American cartoonists, uh, used the tiger to illustrate the exact nature of the, uh, of the Tammany machine in, in, in New York City. And he, uh, he, he was not a nice man. He didn't like the Catholics, he didn't like the Irish, he didn't like the South. He was an ardent abolitionist. <laughs> and he is the only cartoonist who's ever responsible for the arrest and capture of anybody, which was uh, William Marcy Tweed. William Marcy Tweed had escaped from the United States to Spain, and they actually recognized him and arrested him after seeing Nast's cartoons of, of him. He did drawings of the Union soldiers uh, during the Civil War, and I think that might have uh, been the precursor to my favorite cartoonist, who's Bill Malden. Bill Malden was the uh, cartoonist for Stars and Stripes during the Second World War, and he, he drew these two soldiers that he invented, Willie and Joe, typical American infantry soldiers. And they, they looked kind of sad and kind of bedraggled, and their, their helmets were dented, and they needed a shave, and their uniforms were a mess. And uh, General Patton, who didn't like this, he thought this was bad for morale, and here he was, a full general, calls in Malden and yells at him and says that he's, the cartoons are bad for morale. Malden was an E-5 sergeant. And he took this yelling at from Patton, and he didn't say anything. And later, it, General Eisenhower said, told Patton to knock it off because the men actually loved the cartoons and they were actually good for, uh, for morale. When the American army finally got to Paris, uh, victorious, Patton decided to have a big dinner for all of his high-ranking officers. And so he, he commandeered one of the Paris uh, city halls, and he laid on the dinner, and he said to his men, he said, you know, we need, we need some uh, decorations here. Why don't you get that wise-ass cartoonist, get him up here and have him draw some funny stuff for the wall. So they, they called Malden and he came up, he was in Italy, they, he came up and the, the day before this big dinner for the officers, he, he did some drawings of, of his guys, Willie and Joe. Kind of gaunt-eyed, dented helmets, needing a shave, uh, uniforms a mess. And before the dinner, he put these drawings on the outside of the windows of the, of the dining hall so that his guys were looking in at the officers having a big, big fest. Malden was a great friend of one of my favorite editors, Kay Fanning, who some of you might know, who was the first who hired me at the Christian Science Monitor. And she was in the city room, she told me this, she was in the city room of the Sun-Times with Malden the morning that Kennedy was shot. And they were, in, they were in shock and sorrow, and they stood there looking at the television news. And then Malden said, well, I guess I have to go draw something. And he went back to his office, and he, he, he used himself as a model, as a physical model. And he had a Polaroid camera on a tripod, and he set the, the camera, and he sat down in a chair, and he put his leaned forward and he put his head in his hands as if weeping. And then he used that Polaroid to draw Pops' most famous cartoon, which was Lincoln at the Lincoln Memorial, leaning forward and weeping. And the cartoon, as, as, as we say today, went viral. Everybody printed it. It caught the nation just right. And uh, a few days later, Kay said to him, if you still have that drawing, I'd really like to have it. And he said, well, unfortunately, 
I've already given it away, he said. But if you really want it, I still have the Polaroid. So we have, we have learned from each other, and I, I think, well, for example, we learned from, from uh, Paul Conrad that if you're going to have a friend at the paper, it should be the publisher. Conrad was a great friend of the elder uh, Chandler at the uh, LA Times, and a, uh, at, at, the, at the LA Times, and he, uh, uh, he and Chandler both shared a profound loathing for Richard Nixon, and he had done a cartoon once where he had uh, Nixon on the cross, and he had one hand partially nailed in, and with the other hand he had a hammer, and he was hammering, hammering the spike in. I think you know that most newspapers would not print a cartoon like that. First of all, first of all, it was religious symbolism, and second, Jesus Christ, and so on and so forth. But the editors at the LA Times stuck it right in, and off it went. From Herblock, we learned that if you're going to work for a paper, you should own part of it. So at one point in the Washington Post, they were having some financial problems, and they called in their top editors and, uh, and Herblock, and they said, would you take stock? instead of uh, money every, every week, or part, part, part stock. And so Herb Locke said yes he would, because he loved the paper and he loved the job, and he never changed his formula for many years. And things got better at the Washington Post. The stock went up, and at one point it split, 72 to 1. When Herb Locke died, he was worth 50, $50 million dollars. I, I, amazing. I, I, my first cartoon that I sold to the editor at the Times Argus in Montpelier, Vermont, uh, Nicholas Montserrat, who was the grandson of the famous British writer. And he said, well, we've just gone to Offset, so we don't have to pay for engraving, and we'd like to use some local cartoonists. And uh, However, we can only pay you a dollar a cartoon. I said, God, a dollar a cartoon. He said, well, said, that's what we pay the syndicate guy, Herblock. <laughs> and I remember thinking, Herblock, God, he must be starving, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm going to show some uh, cartoons here, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. I will say that uh, the guy who has inspired me all through my... Uh, career, I guess we'll call it, is uh, Patrick Oliphant, who is now doesn't draw anymore because of uh, physical problems. But uh, uh, from Patrick Oliphant, I learned that I'll never be as good as Patrick Oliphant. So if anybody has any questions, otherwise, if I push the right button here, we will see some. Uh, this was done yesterday. A piece of uh, censorship up in the corner is Uncle Scrooge in his money bin. Uh, actually, the government of several socialist countries in, in uh, Latin America outlawed Uncle Scrooge. We're, we're very much against it. <laughs> the most curious character in American politics is, 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 is Pence, uh, who must wake up like this. If anybody has any, any questions, I forgot to stop and ask for that. And anyway, just raise your hand and we'll go on. Uh, recurring joke, of course, but is uh, the bone spurs. Uh, this is a, a comment on this is that with color, with uh, Photoshop, which makes it very easy to add color and you can really do some things that you might not be able to do in, in black and white. Uh, as in this one here with the blue and the red uh, juxtaposes, uh, the red uh, uh, for the Republicans and the blue for the, for the Democrats. Now, I, I don't know whether there's going to be a blue wave, but 
uh, sometimes you advise the editors, uh, stick this one in the drawer someplace in case it goes. Anyway. This one, of course, is completely wrong because it turns out that uh, Bolton uh, is no longer around, uh, filling uh, Tr Trump's head. The part I like about it is just the little light bulb hanging from the... Uh, one of the things about cartoons is that you can go into f fanciful uh, uh, circumstances that probably would not, uh, would not be photographable. So here, a, a rape in progress. I don't know if a great many people uh, ran this cartoon, the Rutland Herald did, uh, but a, a rape in progress trying to get across the, the fear and the, and the power of, the, of a rapist, a group of rapists. And again, uh, borrowing from Heinrich Clay, the symbolism of uh, alligators coming over uh, after Lindsey Graham. <laughs> Plus the symbolism of Lindsey Graham as a, as a, as a caddy, a little, little, as a little caddy guy. That was a wonderful shot, Mr. Trump, yeah. I put this one in to illustrate the uh, technique of, uh, of uh, uh, perspective for which, in order to do perspective, all these uh, bricks and things like that, you have to have two push pins. Which, <laughs> that's, the, that's the technique. One over here and one over here, and then you take your ruler. And, but it's, it's, it's quite effective. Again, more soldiers. I'll, I'll read this one. Uh, remember the guy Morales, who used to be in our unit, the guy who came to the US 10 years old, did well in school, went to college then enlisted, made sergeant, served in a combat soon, honorably discharged, got married, had two kids. What about him? They're deporting him. And uh, this actually, actually did happen. The, the, the stories that are gonna soon, fairly soon come out of the mistakes and the cruelty within ISIS are, are gonna shock everybody. This one's sort of based on the great uh, Edgar Allan Poe story, The Descent into the Maelstrom, which has scared me as a child and I hope that I can um, repay the repay the favor. Uh, again, if, you, if you're talking to uh, uh, younger editors who don't really know uh, Shakespeare that well, why would you say cry havoc and let slip the dogs of law? Well, you know, you don't want to call lawyers dogs, do you? Well, yes, yeah, well, why not? Right. And again, this is the Trump era judges, which are going to be a, a continuing problem. Putin as the uh, latter-day uh, czar, which, which I think he is, with a, a Russian soldier with a half a bottle of vodka gone, down be, uh, down be, don't bother hacking the American election. This time they do such a good job of screwing themselves up. This is actually done before the Iowa uh, Democratic Caucus. Right? Here we are, loyal Americans lost in the desert. Behold, a star rises in the east. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not sure of the latest news on Mr. Zuckerberg, uh, but uh, the, the amount of information that they now have on Americans and the amount that they've interfered with your, your privacy is, is uh, pretty much endless. There's a tradition of drawing paintings of dogs playing poker, which I have used a couple of times to indicate the, uh, the uh, FBI. And, uh, and the one over on the corner, he said, well, you can't trust a man who doesn't have a dog. Okay. Again, taking a, a, a scene from a movie, Lee. <laughs> Father, part four. Right. This is a, a, a scene which I uh, stole from, uh, uh, from uh, Heinrich Clay. And Heinrich Clay, it's a monkey sitting on top of a, an elephant, and he has him not by the tail, but by the scrotum. And I, I, I did it first with the scrotum, and then the very nice lady at the Washington Post Writers Group said, uh, no, uh, we, we, we don't want scrotums, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I put this one in to illustrate the wonder of Photoshop. You can take a, uh, one of the things that's difficult to draw is the American flag, because it has so many stars. But uh, that little blue field there with all the stars, actually, I just stole it off the internet and then brought it into Photoshop, and, and uh, there it is, just perfect. Saves a great amount of time. 
Uh, one of the arguments against this mo uh, film, also from the nice lady at the Washington Post Writers Group, was that uh, Trump's uh, uh, cleavage, rear cleavage, is showing. And we talked about it for several days, and then finally she, she gave up. Uh, one thing you can do is valuable in, in a cartoon is that you can go to a fanciful reaction to something stupid like arming to stop uh, schoolyard shootings, you just give everybody a gun. And then the girl is writing her report by Cat Fluffy. Uh, this is actually based on a, the Archie Bunker theory of how to stop plane hijacking, which is as the people go on the plane, all the passengers just give everybody a gun. And it would stop plane hijacking, which in fact, it would. It's ridiculous, but it would actually work. Uh, one of the best pieces of uh, animation ever done by the Disney people is the uh, Legends of Sleepy Hollow. And this is supposed to be, if you can't tell from the, from the skillful uh, caricatures, of uh, uh, Nancy uh, Pelosi lighting, the, uh, uh, lighting the, the pumpkin of the Headless Horseman. The, uh, if you ever have a chance to see it, it's, most of it is on the, on the internet. It's a marvelous piece of, uh, of animation. Uh, here's a quote from Mark Twain, don't fight people with by, uh, ink by the barrel. Uh, one, one question that always arises when you're drawing this is the action, has it, is it just about to take place? Is it taking place in the cartoon or has it just, just happened? So in this case, it's just, it's just happened. A great many uh, editors don't uh, re remember that the origin of the phrase fiddler on the roof actually comes from Ivy Singer, who's, who said that the Jews as a people were like a fiddler on the roof and uh, because of the, the danger of their, of their position. But if you had an IDF guy there with a, with a, with a Glock, you'd be all set. With, or an Uzi, you'd be, all, you'd be all set and be a lot safer. I think one of the strangest people going on is Jared Kushner, who has this unholy relationship with the Saudis, uh, who is apologizing, saying he came directly from work. Uh, another a, a, a scene uh, stolen from Dr. Strangelove, where uh, Slim Pickens rides the bomb down to total destruction. Uh, everybody has done Slim, a cartoon of Slim Pickens riding the bomb down, in this case. Uh, going back to that old story, the lady or the tiger, whether the, it's going to be the Mueller report or some bimbo that Trump was involved with. I like this. I never saw the movie, actually, but I loved the ads and the stills that came out of it uh, of the life of Pi. And this was when uh, Cy was, C was facing uh, the problem of inflation. Again, uh, a tiger. And Mitch says he's the Grim Reaper. Well, let me put that a different way. <laughs> Again, Mitch in the swamp. I, uh, I, I, I have studied swamps, and uh, I love to use the, the, uh, the, the mythology of it and the, and the appearance of it. One of the great uh, political phrases is uh, dynamiting the outhouse, or blowing up the outhouse. And so this is my own personal uh, congressman up there, Jerry Nadler, who was trying to get rid of the House of Trump. It, it didn't quite work. Warming waters mean northern borders may move farther, so trying to sneak across the border to take Americans' jobs don't want, to take jobs Americans don't want, eh? Um, and uh, this one I did, I had a joke involved with this, and they said, well, you know, the thing is so horrible, the burning of Notre Dame, that just, just leave it the way it is, and but I, insult, I, I, I included it today because uh, within the Photoshop program, I actually probably shouldn't reveal this, but there was a way of drawing fire uh, that comes with the program. And it's just wonderful. I mean, it's just, it doesn't take any brains at all, and it's it just uh, very, very realistic. But whether or not it, many people uh, got the Quasimodo uh, reference there, that's uh, still to be seen. You know, I'm, I don't know whether I'm a hero or a defender of the homeland or a Trump re-election worker. Just be happy you live in a democracy where you get to choose. Again, rockets coming out of uh, Putin's brain. 
Uncle Sam throwing up in the toilet after watching. Uh... <laughs> Nobody really knows who Uncle Sam is. Is he the American people? Is he the American ethic? Is it, what is it? Because nobody knows what it is, it's even more useful. Uh, this one, based on uh, some years ago, a, a black man was dragged to death behind a, a pickup truck. A horrible way to die, of course. And that the democracy uh, down south, they're doing sort of the same thing with the boat. When I was uh, stationed in Texas, I, I, I went, would go down to these Texas roadhouses and these wonderful Texas ladies in super tight jeans would be down there playing pool and uh, drinking Lone Star. Uh, and I just, I just fell in love with the whole imagery of it. This was one, and then there is, uh, here's another one. Uh, Michael Ramirez, who's to the right of uh, Genghis Khan, he is a, he, he's very right wing, but he's a marvelous artist, and he will draw from time to time a ship with all of the rigging. It's a lot of work to draw all those, all those ropes going here and there until I figured out that nobody knows where the ropes go, so you just put in a bunch of ropes and you're going to... Uh, this also comes from the very uh, well-known imagery of the little guy standing in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square. I would suggest you don't try that today, not with uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, I don't know if anybody ran this one or to any great extent. Uh, rosary and on the rosary beads are little kids. This is just stupid. Uh. <laughs> I've been fascinated by the link between people who voted for Trump and the effect of, of his policies. Uh, were on them. This guy said, well, I'd like to know whose fault this shutdown is. Well, it's your fault. You voted for him. It has to be everybody's favorite little girl, Greta Thunberg. Uh, marvelous, marvelous little person. Which, <laughs> uh, I hope it works out this way. And this from the uh, terminology of the tail wagging the dog. And again, uh, animal anatomy. I am all powerful. I cannot be prosecuted. I cannot be questioned. I cannot be indicted. I cannot be charged. Not only that, but I can fly. <laughs> Herb Block always did cartoons in which took place in the Oval Office, and that is the well-known Resolute Desk. Someone, not me, but did a cartoon said with, with Bush seated behind the, uh, or, or I guess it was Trump seated behind there after they had pulled out from the from the Kurds, and he said, well, at least the desk is resolute. Uh, sort of explains itself. Um, and finally, again, animal race hatred. You can run, but you can't hide tigers and elephants and everything else. Right? So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer. I'm interested in knowing what your art background is. Uh, I didn't go to art school, but I've been to a lot of anatomy classes, of figure drawing classes. My parents both went to Cooper Union, and there was always uh, uh, art materials around the house. Uh, and so we always were encouraged to draw as much as possible. And uh, you know, it's, it's fun. You know, it's, uh, I've never really made any serious money uh, at cartooning, editorial cartooning. Yes. Right back here. No, Hi. Sorry. Censorship. Which cartoons uh, were censored the most or did editors object to the most? And did you ever censor yourself, draw something and say, just can't go ahead with this? Uh, yes. I, I, she asked about censorship. I censored my, myself. I, there's certain terminology which is just, I think, is funny because it doesn't affect me. And uh, but other people would be would be very uh, very angry or angry about or would be hurt about. So I just don't do it. I mean, at the Washington Post Writers Group, for example, she has a rule against making fun of people who are who are, who are fat. Uh, so we don't do body shaming, and and we don't we don't 
maybe people will laugh at it, but they could do that someplace else on their own time. And, uh, and I, I guess I can't think of any, I have to say that recently, since the F word and the N word, all these words that are popping up that were never, you, were never even thought about back when, when, I, when I was younger, uh, you don't know whether there's any sort of a censorship rule at all. Plus, if it's on the internet, uh, the audience is not a localized audience like a readership in New York or a readership in Vermont. So you just do it, and if people don't want to look at it or find it offensive, don't. I don't know if that's a very good answer, but that's what. I did a cartoon last week of Hitler putting the Medal of Freedom around Rush Limbaugh's neck. And uh, somebody objected. Uh, oh, it's only one person, but I mean, I, and I don't think a lot of people ran it anyway. With the syndicate, that we put them out in the Washington Post News Service, and we never know whether they're used or they're not, or they're not used. Right. If you had to do an autobiographical cartoon, what would it look like? Um, well, would probably be me up on the cross nailing my other hand in or something like that. Right. Could we sick you on Trump's base? Could you get through to that base with your cartoons? I, I don't know. I, I, I was in Israel once with my hero, Pat Oliphant, and the lady said that, that when they when they had people from overseas, they always asked the American embassy if they would chip in some money for their, for their, uh, their help, for their, for their board and so on. And she said that the Bush administration said, well, who's coming over? There's three cartoonists, Pat, me, and Ann Telnes. And they said, uh, and they, they said that, that the Bush people said that the, at, the, at the embassy said, well, uh, not Danziger. And they said it in front of Pat. And I thought, it's not going to get any better than this. <laughs> Hold on. All right, there are at least two of us in the room who are from the Washington Star era of Pat Oliphant. Yes, I know who the other one is. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think so, you do. Yeah. Um, so could you please tell us your favorite hanging out with Pat Oliphant story, particularly with regard to dirty cartoons that he would draw, and then no matter how drunk he was, he would confiscate? Uh, I never saw him real drunk, but uh, he, uh, he did like his, uh, his jar, and he, uh, I was with him one time in Washington. Um, the, uh, I never understood why no one else hired him after the star folded. Uh, I, if I had been an editor or publisher, I would have done it. But it's, it's surprising, the newspaper business being what it is, sometimes they really don't want to say anything and they really don't want to be interesting and amusing. I mean, Tina Brown said the reason that American newspapers are failing isn't because they're paper, it's because they're dull. And a lot of them, a lot of them really are. I, uh, well, you know, I, we just talk, talk shite for a couple hours and then get sick of each other. And that was, uh, uh, he is go his work is going to be, uh, installed in the University of Virginia Archives Library uh, at the end of uh, March, and I'm going to go down there and, and uh, bear witness or something. I don't know what. Right? No, he's, he's a very, very funny guy. Most of the stories that I can remember about, I can't tell here. You know, just, I mean, they're Australian. You know. he, said, he said that, see, was it something? And he said, well, I hope this doesn't offend anybody. He said, well, he said, you know, it's like the dog that was fucking the skunk who said, I've enjoyed about all of this I can stand. <laughs> <Yeah>. Over here. <laughs> uh, your, uh, your cartoons are so wonderfully powerful and amusing, and you're certainly in friendly territory here. But I am curious whether, because there are people who care about Trump are so passionate, do you ever get hate mail for what you've done so wonderfully? 
with the internet, you do get hate, hate mail. She asked if I ever got hate mail. With the internet, you do get hate mail, and some of it, I just apologize. I mean, it's it's the best thing to, is the best thing to do in in any case. As an example of my my little Irish granny who said, you know, just say you're sorry, and it goes away. Right. That was her advice for Richard Nixon. She said, if Richard Nixon had just said, look, folks, some of my guys made a mistake. I'm very sorry. It won't happen again. Would have been fine. Everybody would have forgiven him. Right. Right. There are fewer papers around than there used to be. Uh, how many run your cartoons? The cartoons now in syndication, well, I've been with the Rutland Herald, which as I'm sure you all know, is the second oldest newspaper in continuous publication in the United States. I think the Hartford Current is the oldest one. And uh, I've been with them for 40-something years. Uh, like all of other papers, they're going through some rough times, but we're still there. Getting more than a dollar? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes not even that. Yeah. Uh, the... Uh, uh, Washington Post news service includes the cartoons, and that goes out to uh, four or five hundred papers every day. So, and we, we never really know who uses them and who doesn't. But the letters do come back, notes do come back on the internet. I have never written a letter to a cartoonist, good or bad. Anyway. Over here, uh, Jeff. Uh, uh, all of the cartoonists you've mentioned have been men. Are there any women? who are renowned for political cartoons? Ann Telnase is one of the best women cartoonists working today. She's brilliant. She has a deal with the Washington Post to do, to do cartoons and to do animations. My favorite woman cartoonist was a woman named Etta Holm, who has is, who is passed on. She was at the Fort Worth Telegram. And uh, I was on a panel with her one time. And, and she was a little, little Texas lady. And somebody said, well, what happens, what do you do if you don't have an idea? And she thought for a moment, she said, well, if I don't have an idea, I just draw something anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, over here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, what are the challenges of drawing Trump? Has your style with Trump evolved over the course of his administration? And when will you get under the comb over? Well, I, I don't know. I, I thought that people should have figured out that any man who had his hair arranged that way, I mean, four, five, ten years ago, it, there was something wrong with them. Normal men don't bleach their hair, and, you know, but, but, they, but they didn't. They, I, I, don't, I don't know. People, it's, it's hard to figure. And at this point, all we can do is just wait and hope that the best thing happens. It's almost ridiculous to criticize this guy who's obviously out of his mind. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's All like the way a, back here. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, uh, Donald Trump is a gift to satirists and cartoonists, or is he? My question is, does his outrageousness make it more difficult or easier to find a cartoon? I think it gets harder to say something new because it's already been said. Uh, uh, and if he is reelected, I don't know what the hell we're going to do. I mean, it's really <laughs> serious. And he also, I mean, with Pence, you have nobody to kind of say, well, uh, you know, that we have a good fallback position. And nobody knows who the hell Pence is. As a cartoonist, who would you like to be the next president? Uh, I'd rather, I, I'm not going to answer that question because right now uh, there's another debate coming up and we'll see what happens. Um, you know, Michael Bloomberg is, you shouldn't be able to get uh, elected just on the strength of your money, but, well, maybe you can. I don't know. Right. Would you have more trouble cartooning a woman? Uh, no, we, we've had, uh, I've had a lot of, well, this is one of Hillary, uh, in the uh, Wyeth painting out there, uh, I, I, I don't think there's any automatic problem of uh, 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 cartooning a woman. No, no, no. What, what do you use for your source material? Is it is it just 
and it's not, I don't mean just, but is it just reading newspapers and watching news, or do you go have lunch with different newsmakers? I mean, what, how do you get information to then decide to do a cartoon about it? Well, for sources, I, I read four newspapers a day. I'm the only person in my building who gets a paper in New York Times. I read about four newspapers a day, including some overseas ones, and uh, then things like The Economist and, the, uh, and this awful thing, The Spectator. Uh, but it, it, it comes from all over the place, and some of them are just silly. I mean, you just want to do something that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a break. I'm trying to think of a good example. I can't, but... Uh, um, is, is the Trump appeal that he is a living cartoon? I think that's right, yeah. He is, he is sort of a cartoon for himself. You couldn't, you couldn't sell a novel about uh, a guy like Trump. I, and, uh, No, 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 no. Hi, uh, Jeff, one of Trump's, of his many glaring uh, whatever, is his appalling ignorance of history. And the reason I mention that, I, I was just wondering, if, as a fellow New Englander, yeah. you were at all, gave some thought to when he was up in New Hampshire a week ago and yeah. <laughs> brought up a lot of glee to some of us by confusing Concord, New Hampshire with Concord, Massachusetts. Right, right, yeah. Oh. In Kansas City, yeah, yeah. how proud people were in Kansas. Yeah. Right, I th and I think he, when he went to Hawaii, he said, when I, what is it exactly happened to Pearl Harbor? Yeah, right. Oh, God. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, it, yeah. might be, it, might, it might occur to you that uh, no one would believe you if you put those things in, that, you, that he didn't really say them or something. Well, I guess if you live in New York all your life, you're sort of insulated from a great deal of the outside world as so much goes on here. Right. Jeff, uh, Trump is obviously the gift that keeps on giving. Yes, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> uh, he has been a cartoonist dream, no mm -hmm. doubt about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing what uh, has been a boon to your career. What, what has it done? We've, We've seen cartoonists do presidents before. I don't think we've ever seen anything quite like Donald Trump. Am I right? I think uh, I think George W. Bush was pretty much a gift too. I mean, he was he was funny and he was great. The thing about George W. Bush is he had a personal sense of humor, you know, and, and he had that kind of Texas give a shit attitude, which was which was uh, which was amusing. But yeah, I don't, uh, any questions? Any more questions? Not about Trump. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Hold on, hold on. No, no, we use the mic. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We use the mic. I'm a broadcaster, I should know this. Um, what's your favorite international topic or person? Uh, you know, the best cartoonists in the world are the Brits, but far and away. And they are uh, they're, they're irreverent and, and crazy, and most of them draw very, very well. I don't know if you know that my, my favorite is a guy named Steve Bell who draws for the uh, Guardian. <laughs> Steve, Steve Bell, um, just to bring this all to a close with something humorous. Steve Bell draws in, uh, was drawing about John Major. And John Major was kind of a gray little man when he was the prime minister. And at one point, John Major came out of the men's room with uh, his uh, his shirt tucked into his jockey shorts, the, the elastic band of his jockey shorts, which everybody took to mean that he was such a careful little man that he didn't want to. Anyway, <laughs> so Steve Bell started drawing the cartoons, and he always had the the elastic band of the jockey shorts showing, and people laughed themselves sick, and then he started to have the elastic band come up higher and higher with each, with each passing day until they finally was up here. And then he just said he had the jockey shorts on over his pants, like he put them on the other way. And so finally when, when John Major was forced out, uh, Steve Bell did a cartoon that was a parody of the famous Turner paintings of the Houses of Parliament on Fire. Anybody ever seen that? It's, Glorious painting, and down the Thames comes these jockey shorts floating along. 
<laughs> extremely funny. Back here. Uh, would you like to see cartoons in the New York Times? They used to run them. Um, uh, now they, they used to run them on Sunday, run a few on Sunday, and then just for some reason they decided to, to stop. I, I, I have other things to think about. I don't know why they do it. I don't know why. why what happened to the weekly news quiz? I, th I thought that was a great thing. Why, uh, uh, hmm? Oh, they do online. Well, there you go. I, look, I work for the... I mean, I worked with and read the New York Times all my life. It, I don't even think about why it does anything. It just sort of shows up. One more question, maybe? Uh, Obama was our first black president. Did you have any special problems cartooning him? No, I, I loved Obama. I thought he was a brilliant, brilliant president, and I thought he was just a brilliant human being and, and did a fine job. And I think we did a, did a few cartoons about him, but they were... I have to admit, I was, I was mildly, and I was mildly impressed. I was impressed with the damn country for electing him. No. Okay, thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. Jeff, thanks. That was magisterial and amusing. Thank you. <laughs>